looking at this question to the right, it asks, what are the products of each of the following reaction sequences? I'll show you an in-depth discussion on that with the answers to each of these sequences right now. What does each one of these sequences do to the starting material shown? When in doubt, the answer is always pi halves. In reality, however, the answer is not pi halves. If you put that down, you will be wrong. Let me show you the real answers. Starting with this molecule called toluene, I subject it to these conditions. Ooh, dang, I forgot to write aluminum chloride catalyst right here. This, of course, is a Friedel-Craft acylation reaction, which places this acyl group right here onto the ring. Where does that group go? Well, that depends on what this pre-existing methyl is. That methyl is a donor. We have to remember dope. Donors make things go ortho and para. So I'm going to get this acyl group placed on the ortho positions relative to this methyl and the para positions, a mixture of both of those products. For the sake of ease, I'm only going to draw the para isomer right here, but we sort of can have in our brains the understanding that the ortho isomer is also going to be made as well. At this point, I now treat this with these conditions, uh, nitric acid, sulfuric acid. That, of course, places an NO2 onto the ring. Where does it place it? That's going to be depend on the pre-existing substituents. This methyl group is a donor, which means that it's going to place things ortho and para. This acyl group, this entire group right here, is a withdrawer. It wants to place things meta. Well, let's look at this donor thing. Now, when you have competition between a donor and a withdrawer, the donor always wins, but sometimes they're actually working together. The position that is uh, ortho relative to this methyl group is going to be that position right there, or that position. It doesn't matter which one you pick since it's totally symmetrical down the middle. I'll just pick the one on the right. It honestly doesn't matter. Now I've got this acyl group. What position is meta to the acyl group? Well, if I look over, this is the position that's ortho to this acyl group. The next position over is meta, which means that both of these, the methyl and the acyl group, are vying for the same position, that one that I've placed dots next to. So my final product of this reaction is going to be that one. The next reaction, I treat this molecule with NBS and light. NBS and light does the same thing as bromine, Br2 and light. It places a bromine on the benzyl carbon. That is, if you have a benzyl carbon that has at least one hydrogen on it, do I? Remember, a benzyl carbon is a carbon that's one position away from the benzene ring. Benzyl, 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 benz. One away from his friends. Ooh. That is that position right there. It does have at least one hydrogen on it, which means that the product of this reaction is going to be that right there. Now, I take this molecule, treat it with sodium cyanide followed by aqueous acid. What in the world does that do? Well, that's actually a two-stepper. The first step, what's going to happen is the sodium cyanide, and I'm just going to treat it, I'm going to write down cyanide right there, is going to do an SN2. Cyanide comes in there, kicks off the bromide, and that gives me that product right there. Now what in the world happens if I take this uh, group that contains a cyanide, also called a nitrile, same thing, and I treat it with aqueous acid? What, what does that do? Well, you should remember from a different lecture slide, I hope, that if you take any type of nitrile group, such as this, and you treat it with aqueous acid, what occurs is this carbon right here is converted into a carboxylic acid group. That's what happens. With that in mind, if I take this group and I treat it with aqueous acid, it's going to do the same thing. So my final product from this two-step sequence is going to be that. Let's move down to line two. I take a benzene ring, treat it with these conditions. I end up uh, putting this acyl group onto the ring. There's not any uh, existing substituent on this ring right now, so I don't have to care about where that's going to go. So that gives me that product. Now, if I take this product and treat it with bromine and iron bromide, now that's different from Br2 and light. Remember that Br2 and light places a bromine on the benzyl carbon if you have at least one benzyl carbon that has at least one hydrogen on it. That happens to be the exact same thing that occurs if you treat uh, a similar compound with NBS and light. NBS is just a milder way of getting bromine onto a molecule. <coughs> bromine and iron bromide, however, what that does is it places a bromine onto the ring itself. Not onto the benzyl carbon, but onto the ring. Where does that go? Well, that depends on the nature of the existing substituent. This is an acyl substituent. That substituent is a withdrawer, so I remember W equals M which means that the bromine is going to go meta relative to that substituent. So the final product of this reaction is that. Now I take this molecule and I treat it with magnesium followed by formaldehyde. What in the world does that do? Well, that's actually a two-stepper. 
In the first one, I take this molecule that contains a bromine, a bond into this ring, and treat it with magnesium. Magnesium is going to insert between the bromine and the carbon. That actually takes this molecule and converts it into that one, a Grignard reagent. Now as I look at that, off the top of my head, I honestly think that this Grignard reagent, as soon as you form that, remember you, when you're forming one of these reactions in an actual flask, you're not making one molecule all by itself. You've got an entire flask of zillions and zillions of these. You're treating it with magnesium and making zillions and zillions of these. I think that in reality, this Grignard reagent would probably react uh, with the carbonyl in neighboring molecules. Uh, nevertheless, um, we're going to pretend that that doesn't happen because that doesn't seem to have been considered when they were writing this question. So if I take this molecule and then treat it with step two, which is formaldehyde, what in the world occurs? Well, we have to remember that a Grignard rea uh, reagent essentially behaves as if there were a negative charge bonded, or a negative charge on the carbon that's bonded to the magnesium. Now, of course, this is an oversimplification. The magnesium is still there, but it essentially, that's how it behaves. There's a negative charge on that carbon. If I draw out formaldehyde and try and uh, actually see what it looks like, you should notice that it looks like this. It's a carbon with two hydrogens on it and then a double bond of the oxygen right there. So if I have this molecule staring at this molecule, what occurs is that negative charge is going to go right in there up the crotch of that formaldehyde and pump these electrons up onto that oxygen. That ultimately results in that product. Now the final step is aqueous acid. That's just a quench. All that does is protonate this negatively charged oxygen. So the final product of this reaction sequence is that. Let's go down to the next one. I take benzene. I treat it with these Friedel-Crafts acylation conditions. It places this acyl group onto the ring, which ultimately results in that product. I take this molecule and treat it with zinc HCl. Remember that zinc HCl are Clemenson reduction conditions. These conditions basically shave off a carbon-oxygen double bond at the benzyl position, replace it with bonds to hydrogen. So we'll take this molecule and convert it into that one. Now I take this molecule and treat it with bromine and light. Now please remember, this is different from bromine and iron bromide. Bromine and iron bromide place a bromine on the ring. Bromine and light, also NBS and light, place a single bromine at the benzyl carbon. If you have a benzyl carbon that has at least one hydrogen on it. That one does, so if I take this and run it through this sequence, I end up getting that. What happens if I take this molecule and treat it with these conditions? Well, this is a two-stepper, very similar to one that we saw just a minute ago. In this first step, I take this molecule, treat it with sodium cyanide. That uh, basically acts just as a source of cyanide. Cyanide comes in here, forms a bond with that carbon, kicks off the bromide SN2 style, and gives me that product. What happens if I take this product and treat it with aqueous acid? That is the step two shown here. Well, as I've shown you before, anytime you have a nitrile, that is a cyano group, and you treat that with aqueous acid, what occurs is that carbon is converted into a carboxylic acid carbon. That's what happens. So, same thing happens here. I take this molecule, treat it with aqueous acid. The final product ends up being that. Let's look at this final sequence. I take this benzene ring, treat it with methyl chloride, aluminum chloride. That's Friedel-Crafts alkylation conditions where the alkyl group is just a simple methyl. So that's going to take a benzene ring and place a CH3 onto it. If I treat that with uh, chlorine and uh, light, it's going to do the same thing as bromine and light. That is, it's going to place a single chlorine on the benzyl carbon. That's that one right there. Assuming that that benzyl carbon possesses at least one hydrogen bonded to it, which indeed it does. I take that, treat it under these conditions. It's going to finally form that product. So that's the answer to each of these reaction sequences.